Last episode, I promised that this time I would give a very brief outline of what Orthodox preterism is and to give some very basic reasons for why I hold that particular position. Are you sure you are ready? What you're about to hear may change your entire perspective about the end times and biblical prophecy. You may also desire to switch to a Mac. Or you may just end up thinking that I'm a first-rate nut bar. Or maybe all of the above. Okay, deep breath now. Orthodox preterism is the position that a great deal of Bible prophecies that most Christians believe are in our future are actually past events that occurred in the first century, most particularly the event known as the Great Tribulation detailed in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, which is found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Many Orthodox preterists also believe that most of the events in the book of Revelation are also talking about events that happened in the first century. Now, there are some who would hold to a preterist position on the Olivet Discourse, but have an idealist position on the book of Revelation. I think as time goes on, you will learn that I don't believe that these positions are necessarily mutually exclusive. Now, before anyone has a complete hemorrhage, Orthodox preterists such as myself absolutely do underscore, underline, bold, write it in the sky, do confess that there are events that are still in our future, particularly the future bodily coming of Christ, the future bodily resurrection of all of the dead, and the future final judgment and consummation of all things. Feel a little better? Now, you may have noted that I've been very careful to use the word, quote unquote, orthodox in detailing my position. I do this because there is a small, but particularly vocal, and a few characters are pretty obnoxious, group of people who call themselves preterists, but are in fact hyper preterists. The hyper preterist view is virtually unknown outside of the internet where strange and novel ideas can be passed off with little accountability or peer review. Hyperpreterists believe that all of biblical prophecy is past. This includes the second coming and the event known as the general resurrection of the dead. Now, hyperpreterists themselves differ wildly on what happens to people who die today but they are universal in denying that there is a future event in which the graves are opened and everyone who has ever lived is raised bodily. They do believe that sin and death continue forever. There there isn't a time when sin and death is completely removed from the earth. The most consistent hyperpreterists go on to deny that even Christ was raised bodily. Now, this will definitely be the subject of a future show, since inconsistent hyperpreterists have a complete meltdown each time I say this. Now, those who know me well know that I do not use the word heresy lightly, and I am pretty tolerant of divergent views within Christianity, even those that other Christians within my conservative evangelical tradition would call heresy. But hyperpreterism goes beyond the realm of tolerance. It denies essentials of the Christian faith recognized throughout the history of the church. Most importantly, the bodily resurrection and the second coming and the consummation of creation. In fact, it comes as a surprise to many Christians that most heresies are only found implicitly in the Bible. Hyperpreterism is one of the few heresies that is found explicitly condemned in several passages. It is nothing more than a modern revival of the Hymenaean heresy that Paul condemned in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. I outline this thoroughly in a piece entitled, Grave Heresy, 
Hyperpreterism, and the Response of the Church. I'll provide a link to that article in the show notes. Now, some people think I am pretty harsh in my denunciation of this heresy and that I'm mean or uncharitable. But the ancient form of this heresy made the Apostle Paul go ballistic, making me look like a downright cuddly little kitten in comparison. Now that the necessary explanation of hyperpreterism is out of the way, I will typically drop the word quote-unquote orthodox from my designation. I am a preterist. There is no qualifier needed. It is the heretics who require a qualifier, not I. Now, some people who hold my position will call themselves partial preterists and call those who are hyper-preterists full preterists. That is beyond unfortunate and very misguided. Hyper-preterism is full of something, all right, but it isn't preterism. I reject those designations, and in fact, as I prepared for this show, I made up my mind that even another introductory episode is needed. So episode three will not dive into the Olivet Discourse, but instead, I'm going to spend some more time on this issue of terminology and why it is important to get that down. So now that you know what I believe, simply that the Great Tribulation is, as they say, put a fork in it, it's done, you may be wondering, how in the freaking world did I ever get such an asinine idea? As I said in the last episode, I wasn't taught this by my church. In fact, I was a pretty zealous and a darn good, if I don't say so myself, defender of a dispensational futurism, despite my short time in the faith. I didn't want to go against the grain. It was pretty exciting to think that biblical prophecy was unfolding before our eyes, that we were the special generation that was going to meet Christ in the air and not have to deal with this screwed up world any longer and all those jerks were gonna get theirs. I was most definitely rapture ready. However, in reading the Bible myself and really struggling over many passages, I came to a quite different and at the time quite unwelcome to me conclusion and found in this process that the preterist position has been held by many well-respected theologians over the centuries. But that's getting ahead of myself. I do want to stress this maxim. Theological novelty is not a good thing. Let's repeat that together. Theological novelty is not a good thing. If you come up with something that no one or nearly no one has thought of or held in any substantial numbers in the historical church, it's a pretty good bet that you are either a theological genius that has figured out something that the collective church has missed for millennia, or you're utterly wrong. Guess what option is the more likely of the two? And without being unduly harsh, that is what really cracks me up about hyperpreterists. They actually believe that the entire church has missed the most basic contours of biblical eschatology for 2,000 years, but they have it figured out. I think that's what's called chutzpah. So I am going to outline in this episode three basic planks that undergird the preterist position. I will upload to the show notes a study guide that I had prepared for a similar presentation that I had given to a philosophy of religion class at Appalachian State University. If you want further detail, then I can give in the time that we have here together today. So consider what I'm saying here an appetizer and the study guide a nice juicy steak or um, a tofu casserole for the more vegetarian minded. I guess. Okay, these three planks are number one, timing, number two, chronology, and number three, apocalyptic language. Okay, plank one, timing is indeed everything. When interpreting a passage, it is pretty important to nail down these particular questions. Stop! What is your name? It is Arthur, King of the Britons. 
What is your quest? To seek the Holy Grail. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? What do you mean, African or European swallow? Who is the passage about, or to whom is it written? What is the passage speaking about? When did the events happen, or when were they supposed to happen? Where do the events in the passage occur? And why or how do these events occur? Most evangelicals do great with all of these questions, except one, the when question. How so? Well, they subordinate, without due justification, the when question to whatever they have decided the what question means, without interpreting these questions holistically, first within the immediate passage context, and then from within the biblical context as a whole. So if one has already decided that the what is the fiery destruction of the whole planet, it would be pretty hard to accept at face value a when statement that appears to place this event within the lifetimes of the original disciples. So, something has to give. So do the when statements really suggest that the Great Tribulation is a past event? I believe the answer is an unequivocal yes. I highly suggest that you have a Bible handy while listening to this podcast or to go back with the study guide and read the verses that I am going to assert support my position for yourself. Don't take my word for anything. I have no degrees or special seminary training. I am a lay Christian putting her OCD to good use by mastering a particular area of biblical study. Unless stated otherwise, my translation of choice will be the New King James Version. So let's dig into the text. In Matthew 24, which is going to be the primary version of the Olivet Discourse that I will use because I think it's the most complete, though I will throw in verses from Luke and Mark when they add some clarity. So in Matthew chapter 24, after describing the Great Tribulation, Jesus announces in verse 34, Most assuredly, I say to you, This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. This statement occurs in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And please note that some of the fabulous predictions, such as the stars falling from the sky, occur prior to that emphatic statement, meaning that even that event is included among all these things that were to occur within this generation. This is not something that is just limited to one translation. All of the major Bible translations render the passages this way, as do the modern English paraphrase versions. For example, the Good News Bible says, Remember that all these things will happen while the people of this time are still living. Well, that's pretty straightforward. And if we were talking about nearly any other passage, I even doubt that this would be controversial at all. Futurists, meaning those who believe that the Great Tribulation is future, have devised multiple ways to get out of this pickle. It isn't like they just didn't notice it, but those explanations will go beyond the limited purpose in this introductory episode, which is just to show you that I haven't sprouted a third eyeball or a second head, and I have good biblical reasons for my position, even if you still disagree. So is verse 34 the only timing verse that supports my position? Well, no. Let me draw your attention to a few more before moving on, and there'll be even more in the study guide. Okay, let me draw your attention to Matthew chapter 10, verse 23. Jesus says, When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Jesus is speaking to his then-living disciples, sending them on a missionary assignment back then, And he pretty much tells them, you're not going to finish it until the Son of Man comes. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. 
Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I mean, to put it in more everyday speech, some of you guys standing here, you're not going to die until you see this happen. Whatever this is, people that are listening to Jesus right then, or some of them at least, are still going to be alive. Okay, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, I remember when I was a pretty new Christian and my husband wasn't yet a Christian, but he was interested in the Bible and we would sit and I'd read verses to him and I read that passage to him and he basically said, wait, what did you just say? go back and read that again. You see, without any preconceived notions, when I read that to him, it was pretty clear to him that the book of Revelation is saying that these aren't things that are future to us. Those were things that concerned the original audience. It concerned events that were going to happen soon to them. So, plank one of my positive case for preterism is the many clear timing statements in the New Testament. So, plank two is chronology, or in other words, this, then that. So before, while I just dealt with the timing of events, this plank deals with the sequence of events. And I believe that only the preterists can make coherent sense out of the sequential passages in the Bible. One such example is the end of the age mentioned in the disciples' questions in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. The disciples asked Jesus, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When Christ ascended to the Father, he sat at the Father's right hand and is in the process of having all of his enemies put under his feet. This idea comes straight out of Psalm 110, verses 1 through 2, which, to the surprise of many Christians, is the most quoted or alluded to Old Testament passage in the New Testament. I would go so far as to say that if you don't understand the synthesis of Psalm 110, verses 1 through 2, in the New Testament, you can't possibly understand eschatology. And I believe that is the root of the error of all forms of premillennialism. I believe the most important eschatological passage with this allusion to Psalm 110 is the famous resurrection passage of 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 28. Now, I know this passage is a bit lengthy, but it is important that I read it. The Apostle Paul says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That passage to me is just so beautiful and full of hope that, you know, I just want to break out in song. And you guys are really lucky that I resist that, that impulse. It would not be pretty. So, how does this prove or support preterism? Well, let's look at the sequence. 
In fact, although Matthew chapter 24, verse 34 made a preterist out of me, this passage first raised some issues with me about premillennialism. This happened before I was even a preterist. I was, you know, beginning to wonder if perhaps those crazy amillennialists might, might have had something, you know, to what they were saying. So here is the chronological proof. I am going to break this down into a numbered sequential list. One, Christ was raised first. Quite obviously, this is a past event. Two, those who are Christ will be raised when he comes. This is a future event. Now let's digress for a second before I confuse the heck out of my listeners. Preterists do not consider this coming to be the same coming that is associated with the Great Tribulation. And they do not believe that the resurrection of the dead is something that happens at the time of the Great Tribulation, you know, either just after or anything like that. It is a future event. The Great Tribulation is a past event. I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Three, he will come at the end of his reign, making his reign a present reality for us and the end of his reign a future event to us. Four, Christ's reign will continue until he has destroyed all rule and authority and power. Five, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. There are no more enemies after death. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it clear that death is destroyed when all those who are in Christ are raised, an event which happens at his second coming. 6. After death is destroyed, the messianic kingdom is over and it is delivered up to God the Father. Now there are other sequential passages that I could bring up, but I believe this one alone in 1 Corinthians 15 is devastating. Really think about it and try to make sense of it within a dispensational or in fact any premillennialist paradigm. I posit that it is impossible to do so. For instance, just sticking with the pre-tribulation dispensationalism that is the most popular American position and it's the one represented in the very popular Left Behind book series. So this position would state that the event that happens in the twinkling of an eye in 1 Corinthians 15 is the rapture, and it happens before the Great Tribulation or in the middle of the Great Tribulation. Yet this twinkling of an eye event destroys death, according to the Apostle Paul. So how can believers then die during the Great Tribulation, as there will be converts during that time, the Tribulation Saints? Dispensational, pre-tribulational futurists, that's a mouthful, they solve this by shoehorning handy-dandy gaps and multiple resurrection events that are just simply not taught in Scripture. And yes, the attentive listener will note that the implication of what I am saying is that the age to come has at least in some sense already started and the millennium is a present reality. Okay, now let me give you a whack with the third plank. Plank three, apocalyptic language. Or, I am going to punch your lights out. So now are you fearing for your house lamps? No? Didn't I just say that I was going to punch your lights out? Why aren't you hoarding light bulbs in order to recover from this calamity? You don't do so for the same reason that you grab an umbrella rather than a kennel when someone tells you that it is raining cats and dogs. You understand idiom and hyperbole, and somehow we get along as a society with these wild expressions without complete havoc breaking loose. Now someone from another culture might get confused because each culture has its own idioms. So were there such idioms in the biblical culture that are relevant to preterism? Well, let's look at just one of the more dramatic examples from the Great Tribulation prophecy. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened 
and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Aha, you might be thinking. How are you going to get out of that, you waskly wabbit, you? <laughs> Sorry. So then, what do you think that it means? That the very fabric of the universe will unravel? Okay, I guess that is possible in the same way that it is possible that Siamese cats and dachshunds will plummet from the sky. But would those who heard this prophecy originally have understood it that way? I would submit that they would not, because the Bible itself teaches them and us not to interpret it that way. For example, let's go to the Old Testament, which is the context that the original disciples would have been seeped in. It was their culture. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, verses 9 through 10, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Sound familiar? Well, yeah, right. It's just another end-of-the-world prophecy, isn't it? Uh, no. There's a slight problem. The context of Isaiah 13 makes it clear that this is a description of a long past judgment on Babylon. Did the universe literally dissolve back then? And that is not by far the only passage like that. Let's take a look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 32, verses 7 through 8. When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. This describes a long past judgment on Egypt. Yet there is no record of the entire universe going dark. Let's look at just one more, and there are others in the study guide in the show notes. Isaiah chapter 34, verses 4 through 5. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as the fruit falling from a fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom, and on the people of my curse for judgment. Wow, God was really pissed at Edom that he dissolved the entire universe because of their bad deeds. And, you know... Ancient people really were stupid. They missed that. And that means that all of us must really just be brains in a vat because the universe no longer exists. No? Good. I agree with you. And I hope that this casts the whole dissolution of the universe statement in the Olivet Discourse perhaps in a fresh light for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're thinking. Okay, Miss Smarty Pants, but Matthew 24 says that Jesus was to be seen coming on the clouds. Get out of that one. Or as many a smug futurist has asked me, as if I were as dumb as a rock. If Jesus came back already, where is he? And of course the answer to that is simple. Delaware. Or imagine being able to be magically whisked away to Delaware. Hi, I'm in Delaware. Okay, seriously, I really do hope that you don't think that I'm so dumb that I walk into Wall's face first. So that means it did not escape my notice that prior to verse 34, it is stated that Jesus comes in some manner. So does that mean that he was to be seen flying across the sky? Well, that pesky Old Testament comes into play again. And for brevity's sake, I am only going to give one example. There are a lot more, and some of those are outlined in the study guide that I keep pimping here. The book of Isaiah, chapter 19, verse 1. The burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt 
The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its mist. So, did Yahweh saddle up a cloud? A swift cloud, no less. No pokey clouds for him. And ride on into Egypt, dismount, and start kicking over idols? No, of course not. And no one believes that. But... This is very similar language to passages in the New Testament that a lot of Christians take in a really hyper-literal sense. Preterist R.C. Sproul, and yes, R.C. Sproul is a preterist, he summed this up, I think, very beautifully. He said, The advantage of preterism is that it saves the phenomena of the New Testament time frame references. It interprets biblical prophecy according to the images used in scripture itself, and it offers a framework for consistent interpretation of the difficult apocalyptic literature of the Bible, such as that found in Daniel and Revelation. You see, no one takes all of the Olivet Discourse literally, no matter how much they protest. You either take the timing statements literally, or you take the wild apocalyptic imagery literally. What is more biblically reasonable? So now that I've laid out my positive case here, I think that all of a sudden the crazy lady is looking a little less nutty, isn't she? And that was my goal in this introduction. Welcome to my world. So, next episode, I will be getting a bit more into terminology and why it matters. Until next time. Dr. Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins are America's favorite authors of the apocalypse. They're left-behind novels which take biblical prophecies about the end of the world, translate them into fiction. You simply cannot put them down. They really are page turners. Please note that in case of rapture, this podcast will be left unmanned.